Welcome to the Hashtag Invest This Podcast, where the secrets for real estate investing are revealed. Now, here's your host, Scott Bauer. And hello, everybody. I am your host, Scott Bauer. This is the 38th episode of the Hashtag Invest This Podcast. Today, I'm blessed to have Jay Scott on here with us. Jay, how are you? Great. How are you doing, Scott? I'm just doing fantastic. A little bit about him. Um, he goes by Jay. He's, got a, he's a full-time entrepreneur and an investor living in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. He's an engineer and business guy by education and spent most, most, much of his early career in the Silicon Valley uh, part of California where he held management positions at several Fortune 500 companies, uh, including Microsoft and eBay. In 2008, Jay and his wife, Carol, decided to leave the 80-hour work weeks and the constant business travel behind. They quit their corporate jobs, moved, to the, moved back east, got married, started a family, and decided to try something new. That something new ended up being real estate. And in the past nine years, they have bought, built, rehabbed, sold, lent on, and held over $40 million in property. Jay runs the popular website 123flip.com and is the author of three books on real estate investing, including the best-selling The Book on Flipping Houses. His books have sold over 100,000 copies in the past five years and have held, and he's helped investors from around the world get their start with real estate. So Jay, it's a big, uh, you know, a lot of information to start it out with, but I wanted to give the listeners a little bit more about your background and what you're focused on now. Sure. Um, so I started in real estate uh, after leaving the corporate world back in 2008, uh, like you said in, in the bio. Uh, my wife and I, uh, back in 2006, we met, decided to get married. Uh, 2008. Oh, hold on one second. I lost you. I don't know what happened. Um, <coughs> I lost your, your audio. I can't hear you. you. Lost my audio. Weird. Back. Can you hear me? No, I can't hear you. I can start over at the beginning. Yeah, we can start over at the beginning. Go for it. Yep. Actually, do you want a shorter bio? And hello, everybody. I am your host, Scott Bauer. This is the 38th episode of the Hashtag Invest This Podcast. And today, I'm so blessed to have Jay Scott here with us. Jay, how are you? I'm doing great, Scott. How about you? I'm doing fantastic. A little bit about Jay. He goes by, the, by Jay. He's a full-time entrepreneur and investor living in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., He's an engineer and business guy by education, but has spent much of his early and and has spent much of his early career in Silicon Valley, California, where he held management management positions at several Fortune 500 companies, including Microsoft and eBay. In 08, uh, Jay and his wife Carol decided to leave the 80-hour work weeks and the constant business travel behind. They quit their corporate jobs, moved back east, got married, started a family, and decided to try something new, which that something new ended up being real estate. And in the past nine years, they bought, built, rehab, sold, lent on, and held over $40 million in property. He now runs the popular website, 123flip.com, and is the author of three books on real estate investing, including the best-selling, The Book on Flipping Houses. His books have sold over 100,000 copies in the past five years and have helped investors from around the world to get their start in real estate. So with that being said, Jay, why don't you give the listeners a little bit more about your background and what you're focused on now? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, like you just mentioned, uh, my wife and I, my wife's been integral in our business for the past 10 years. Um, we started out in the corporate world. I was a tech guy. She was a marketing person. And we met in 2006 in California. We dated for a couple of years. And then in 2008, when we decided to get married, uh, we realized that it was, um, it, it just wasn't going to work for us to be married in our tech jobs. Basically, she was working 80 hours a week, traveling three and a half weeks a month. I was working 60, 70 hours a week, and I was traveling two, two and a half weeks a month. So it just wasn't conducive to starting a family and, and having kids and all that. So uh, beginning of 2008, we decided to get married. We had a long discussion and decided, hey, we're going to give up the tech world. We're going to move back east closer to where we grew up. Um, and we were going to figure out some way to basically make money. And um, whether it be consulting or start a small business, we had no idea what we wanted to do. Um, but we knew that, that it had to be something that allowed us to put our family and our life first and business second. So 
2008, I think it was May of 2008, uh, we moved back. We decided to, to move to Atlanta um, where we settled down. Summer of 2008, my wife and I are sitting on the couch watching TV. We're still trying to figure out what business we want to start. We're waiting for our wedding. It's coming up in August. And, uh, and I flip through the channels and I turn on a flipping show. And back in 2008, anybody that, was, that was, remembers that, basically every show on TV was a house flipping show. It looks similar today. <laughs> exactly. It's very similar to today. Um, and a lot of these shows actually back then were taking place in Atlanta. My wife was like, oh, I know that place and I know that house. And, and she said, hey, why don't we do that? Why don't we flip a house? We're not doing anything for the next month or two before we get married. We haven't figured out what business we want to start. Let's just flip a house. And I honestly, I thought she was kidding because I'm like the least handy person on the face of the planet. I'm, I'm an electrical engineer that can't change a light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> But she was serious, and I, she's very much into the design and the, uh, the architecture stuff. And so I said, okay, let's, let's give it a try. So spent a couple months studying, looking at houses. I mean, we must have looked at 100, 150 houses before we actually got an offer accepted. Finally got an offer accepted, and on August 8th, 2008, um, we bought our first house. And I remember that day vividly because it was also the day we got married. So oh, wow. Double our, yeah, our, our real estate career literally started the day our family technically started and um, bought that first house. Uh, like I said, we had looked at like 100, 150 houses and we found a couple of them that we liked. So we made offers on multiple houses thinking we'll get one of these and we'll move forward with that one. We got, I think, three offers accepted all in the same week. So we bought that first house on August 8th. The next week, we bought another one. Two weeks after that, we closed on a third one. Um, and we just kept going. And it was crazy. Like this, this, we didn't intend for this to be something we were going to do on a large scale. Really, it was just, a, it was something we we're going to try out and have fun with. But the first year, we ended up doing 15 properties. Um, the second year, I think we did 25 or so, and, and we just kind of kept going from there. So that ended up being um, the business that, that we had thought about starting. Real estate ended up being that thing that we fell into that was going to allow us to kind of um, support our family, but also um, give us the lifestyle we wanted. It allowed us to take our kids to the job sites with us. It allowed us to kind of work when we wanted to work and not work when we didn't want to work. Basically, real estate was the answer to all of our, our financial and business questions. Gosh, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> it, it's, it's fantastic. It was great. And it still is. Right, right. So um, that was basically in 2008 that put, took you through 2009. And now you're doing 25 houses flips, just doing houses? Yeah, so basically 2008, 2009, 10, 11, 12, all we did was flips. Um, and we were, we were modifying our business along the way. 2008, 9, and 10, we focused on REOs because there were just so many of them and it was so easy to, to find good right. foreclosure deals. 2010, 11, 12, we were focused on short sales because there are so many of them. 2012 into 2013, we started yellow, yellow letter campaigns and we were working directly with homeowners who were finally above water again on their houses, but were looking to get out. Um, then 2014 comes around and things start getting a little bit more difficult finding these, these easy flips. Um, basically we were doing, it was more than paint and carpet rehabs. I mean, we were doing some full gut rehabs and stuff, um, but there was a lot of competition even for these tougher rehabs. So 2014, we said, hey, let's, uh, let's try something a little bit different and a little bit bigger so we did our first um, infill new construction project basically okay. we, we found a really old house we knocked it down and working with a, a partner of ours that we've been working with for several years um, we figured out how to build a spec house so 2014 15 16 was kind of we we're doing more flips we had bought a couple rentals but we we're really focused on um, on spec houses because that's where there was some opportunity finally 2016 comes around, 2017, it's getting tougher to find infill uh, lots to build spec houses. So we start focusing more on rentals and multifamily. And so we've kind of been focused on that the last year or two. So I mean, our philosophy is basically we're really opportunistic. Um, we like to go where the deals are. Um, instead of saying, hey, this is what we're good at, we're going to find these types of deals, we say, hey, what kind of deals are out there? And we'll figure out how to get good at those. That's um, really so, good approach. I mean, it really, yeah. it's a better way than just trying to chase the hot item out there right now. Um, Ex exactly. 
I would say that, you know, in both of those things, looking at rentals and looking at multifamily. So let's talk about that for a minute because that's the buzzword in the real estate space right now is multifamily. You know, you yep. look at here in Phoenix, it's blowing up. A lot of people getting into real estate. People have seen yeah. made a lot of money in multifamily. And so they're trying to get it now. Um, and, and same with rentals. I mean, rentals are one of those things that you, if I would have known what I know now in 2008 or nine, I'd be well retired by now. Right. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. But, I mean, where, where are you seeing success with that? Let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit. Yeah. So I'll be honest. Um, we've been really good for 10 years at seeing what that next opportunity is, seeing where the low hanging fruit's going to be. We, we saw uh, REOs in 2008, 9, 10, like I said, we saw short sales coming. And so we jumped on those before other people did. Um, we saw the new construction and the infill um, lot spec houses um, becoming a good opportunity just before everybody else did. Um, and then we saw like rentals and multifamily um, around the same time as a lot of other people. What we're finding is we're no longer being able to figure out what that next thing is. Real estate's gotten so hot over the last few years that it doesn't look to us and maybe we're missing something, but it doesn't look to us like there's any low hanging fruit anymore. Yeah. Um, at this point, it's really, it's, it's brute force. Uh, you got to figure something out and you got to get really, really good at it. If you want to do flips, you got to figure out how to be the best marketer out there for flips. If you want to find multifamily properties, you got to figure out the best ways to, to market for multifamilies and be the best at it. Um, if you want to do new construction, you got to do bigger stuff where you can buy um, large plots of land and do subdivision stuff that other people are either scared to do, don't have the money to do, don't have the knowledge to do. Um, yeah. So it's really going from, or it's gone from in the last 10 years, figuring out what the next low hanging fruit in real estate is to just getting really, really good at a couple things so that you can beat out the competition. And that's, that's just a function of the change in the market. And so these days we are, um, we're, we've been looking for large multifamily for the last couple of years. Like we'd love to buy a hundred or 200 or 400 unit apartment complex, um, but we can't find them. Um, there's just too much competition out there. And same at the low end of the space, the single family homes uh, for rentals, those are really tough. So the one place that we have had some success is kind of in that uh, mid size multi unit. So the 20 to 60 unit multifamily properties. Um, so we bought a few of those over the last couple of years. Problem there and not really a problem, it's an opportunity. But the reason why a lot of those are available is the people that are investing in the single families, they aren't comfortable moving up to 20 or 50 or 60 units. Um, and the people that are investing in the 100, 200, 300 units, they like the ease of management of those. You put in a, a third party property manager, a full-time property manager, and it kind of runs itself. Right. In, in the 20, 30, 50 unit space, um, it doesn't work that way. Um, you're not making enough money that you can hire full-time property management, somebody to be on site every day, somebody to be dealing with the tenants every day. Um, but you need more than what a single family property manager would offer, which is kind of just being on call on the phone. Yep. So, yep. so when it comes to those mid size units, uh, we found a nice little sweet spot there, but it really has forced us to think about how you manage those things and get creative in, in management. So that's kind of our niche over the last year, year and a half. Yeah, and, and super interesting. I mean, it, it's so true. I mean, I think of my single family houses that I have, or even small multifamilies where I have a manager that is offsite. He actually hasn't even seen all the properties, right? But he can do that because it's, it's very hands off for the most part. You have maybe a few hours that you have to deal with it a week, but that's it. You know, on. So let's talk about that in more detail then, because now you found these mid level apartment complexes where Maybe the mom and pop people are still buying them, but they're, they're, you know, there's more opportunity there. How are you managing them? How are you trying to, how are you navigating through that? And what solutions can we give to the listeners on, you know, what, how to, how to, how to really target that and how to go after it? Yeah. So I, I don't know if this is common, but this is something that's definitely worked for us over the last year, year and a half is what we've done is we found other apartment investors, uh, investors in the markets that we're investing in. Um, and these are people buying the same stuff. They're buying the 20, 30, 50 unit deals. Um, and they're having the same challenges we are with, uh, with property management. They, they're not making enough income on their property to hire a full-time person, but they need more than just that, that small mom and pop property management company that's just going to answer the phone. So what we've done is we've kind of partnered with them to bring in a couple full-time people 
uh, they can do property management and we kind of share those people. So we, ha we have two or three property managers that kind of are full time between four different complexes. So those four complexes might be 200 units, which is enough for a full time property management company. Um, and then we split the, pro we split the cost. Right. So, so it's, it might be my, one of my units and then three other um, complexes with other owners. I get 25% of that property manager. I pay 25% of his cost or I pay the cost associated with my units. Um, but between the four of us, we have some full-time people in place that kind of go from unit to unit. So we all have coverage. We all have people that, that are working full-time, um, but we're not paying somebody 100% of the costs, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. And that's a great, that's a great tip. Uh, I haven't really looked at it that way in detail, but that makes a lot of sense. Now, the only question I would have is, are these all the same type of properties? So they're all B properties and B areas that have the same amount of management needs, yep. right? Or are they different? No. So uh, what we found is having the same types of property with the same property manager um, is, is a real, it, it has economies of scale. So we tend to have C and even C minus properties. We have low income properties. Um, we, we pick areas that are good areas, but I mean, there's, there are people that need, housing in, in any, any price point. Um, so we tend to go kind of at the lowest end price point in the decent areas. Um, so many of our tenants are, um, are getting government assistance or they're paying cash weekly because that's how they get paid. They don't have bank accounts. So there's some challenges there. Um, but by using the property managers on our property and then several other properties that are similar properties, we get certain economies of scale. So um, we get a phone call from a tenant that says, hey, I'm looking for a place at $400 a month, which is about what we charge for a lot of our units. Um, and I'm looking in this area and the property manager can say, okay, well, I've got two complexes in that area. I have a couple more that are outside that area and then can kind of say, hey, here are the two that kind of fit your criteria. Um, and so he's attracting the same types of tenants, but then can parse them out based on their criteria as well, um, as opposed to getting like having to solicit a a type tenants and C type tenants at the same time. He's focusing all on those C, C minus type tenants um, and just divvying them up between our properties. Um, the materials that he's using for, for um, doing turnovers and maintenance, pretty much the same. Real low-end carpet, uh, used appliances, um, real uh, inexpensive paint and, and other stuff. Basically, he can buy the same materials for all these different complexes um, and then use them as necessary. So, so it's almost like we're getting the pricing for labor and materials on owning 200 units, right. even though we only own maybe 50 of those 200. And so, and yeah, once again, that makes a lot of sense, but you have to build those relationships with those other owners ahead of time, right? So, you know, let's say you pick an area and you say, oh, this is where I want to invest in your case outside Washington, DC. Is that right? Uh, so actually uh, most of our Maltese are down in Georgia. So we're in uh, Columbus, Georgia and Savannah, Georgia. Okay. Um, interesting. So then you build those relationships and what did you approach those people first or did you locate the property first? And the reason I'm asking this question is yeah. I just got out of a deal <laughs> where this was kind of one of the problems. And had I thought outside the box, maybe we had a conversation ahead of this call mm -hmm. that, you know, this could have been a strategy I could have tried to approach. Right. Yeah. Say, exactly. Like, Hey, you know, we have this property and, <laughs> you and it's very similar. Can we collaborate on the management, make it that much easier for everybody, you know, involved. Yep. We kind of fell into this the first time. Um, we didn't go down that road. We, we bought our first property and um, we were just uh, serendipitously talking to another apartment owner in the area. I think we saw, I think my partner met him at an event or something and they're kind of commiserating over the problems of management and they kind of came to this solution together. Um, and that kind of, it was a light bulb. And um, once that light bulb went off, we realized, hey, this is, a, this is an opportunity not just for this complex, but, but anything else we buy in that area, which was great because we were, we were hesitant to buy anything else because that management part was just so frustrating and so difficult. And it was kind of like, we were going to need to own 200 units before we can bring in a manager. If there's a way that we can like build up to those 216 at a time or eight at a time or 30 at a time, it would just make it that much easier. And so once we realized that, Hey, there's an opportunity to partner with other apartment investors, we basically started reaching out and it's luckily in, in, at least in, in the towns that we work, 
the network of apartment investors in the specific um, space that we're in, the low-income space, there's a handful of them. There's, there's six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them uh, in the whole market. So it really wasn't tough to kind of reach out to each of them and say, hey, let me take you to lunch. Um, just want to like introduce ourselves. We're all trying to do the same thing here. And at first I was a little concerned that they would look at it as, nah, I don't want to meet with my competition. I don't want to give away secrets. I don't want to risk losing tenants or employees. Um, but it really, it wasn't like that. I mean, we, what we realized was we're all facing the same problems. And if there's an opportunity to work together to solve those problems, Hey, let's, let's talk and let's, let's work together because there's, there's plenty of pieces of pie to go around. You know, and that comes down to the abundance mentality versus, Absolutely. you know, I mean, you got to have that abundance mentality or else you're just not going to do very well in this business. And my, exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and the, the key is finding, uh, we've always had that mentality. Um, yeah. the, the key was finding other people in, in the space that had the same mentality. And so what we found is it, actually every, we didn't find a single investor in that, in that, uh, in that market or in those markets that said, no, not interested in talking to you. I mean, literally every single one of them. And, and so we've been working with, with, a lot of them over the last couple of years. Right, right. And so, you know, let's kind of back up to why Columbus, Georgia. You know, you're in Washington, D.C., is that right? I just want to make sure. <laughs> I am in Washington, D.C. now. Um, I lived in Atlanta for five years, which is about uh, two hours north of Columbus. Uh, wow. When we started looking at multifamilies, I had a partner in Atlanta, um, somebody that I'd been working with since 2010. Um, right. And basically, we said, hey, let's look in the markets that we're in. So we started looking in Atlanta. We started looking in D.C., Baltimore. Um, and what we found was come 2015 when we started looking a lot of these primary markets these big markets like dc and baltimore and atlanta just completely saturated we just couldn't find any good deals so then we started going to the secondary markets so the the, the smaller suburbs and 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 cities the second secondary cities in the areas that we were in and we found the same thing just a lot of saturation hard to find good deals uh so my partner said hey let's try some tertiary markets let's try some smaller markets like within three four five hours driving of us um it's close enough that if we have to be down there for a week or two at a time we can do that um but uh, not not so close that uh, that we're running into this problem of big city can't find any deals. Um, and so he kind of drew a, a circle of a three or four or five hour circle around where he lived. I did the same thing. And that was kind of like our farm area for multifamilies. Um, he saw one of the cities that fell well into that range was Columbus, Georgia. Um, and I, we got our first deal when my partner literally just went on, uh, on, on the internet and said, multifamily Columbus, Georgia. And the very first thing that popped up was a loop net listing for a 38 unit uh, in Columbus. And it was a two year old listing. Um, it, uh, uh, basically it was a deal that probably wasn't even a deal anymore, but it listed the owner and my, partner said, okay, I'm going to call this guy and see if he owns anything else. I assume he doesn't have this property because this listing was two years old. Gets the guy on the phone. He said, yeah, I sold that property two years ago, um, but I just took it back in a foreclosure. Uh -huh. um, and literally, I got it back last week. I'm looking to resell it. Are you interested? And we ended up buying that property. Wow. Talk about the universe coming yeah, together. Yeah. It just, just came together for us. And so that was our first, that was a 38 unit property. And that was our first property uh, back in 2017. And we actually just sold it uh, a couple weeks ago. And so is your main focus, 2017 wasn't that long ago, that was last year. No. So do you, do you like to buy them, rehab them, stabilize them, or just buy them, stabilize them and sell them? What is your, what is your market or what's your so we're kind of uh, taking a let's see what happens approach. So ori originally the goal was to buy them and hold, and hold them forever. Um, but we bought a couple of these and we found that we were able to increase the value tremendously over a short period of time. Um, and so we're, we're being opportunistic. We're selling a couple of them. We're holding a couple units or a couple complexes. Um, but it, I'll tell you, when I started, here's, you're going to ask me later, I have a feeling what my best tip is or the best piece of advice I ever got is. Yep. Um, I'm going to start with, with this probably would have been my best piece of advice, but I'm going to use it now and I'll figure out another one for later. <laughs> um, best piece of advice I ever got back in 2009 or 10 when I'm getting started, I sat down with a big investor in Atlanta um, and he had flipped hundreds of properties, owned hundreds of units. And I took him to lunch and, and I said, Hey, so 
if your best piece of advice. So tell me what your best piece of advice is. What am I likely to screw up and, and keep me from doing that? And he said, you're not going to listen to my best piece of advice. I said, well, try me. I promise you I'll listen to it. And he said, my best piece of advice is never sell a property. Anything you buy, don't sell because anything you sell one day, you're going to regret selling it. And I'm a flipper at this point. I did, I'd already done like 15 or 20 or 30 properties at this point. And I'm just like, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to take that advice. I love flipping houses. I'm good at flipping houses. I like making bundles of cash every couple of months. Right. And he said, I know you're not going to listen to me, but I guarantee you one day you're going to look back and you're going to realize that that was the best piece of advice you didn't listen to. And here we are 10 years later. And I wish I had held every single property I'd ever purchased. Um, looking back, he was absolutely right. And it took me many years to realize how right he was. And so for all of your listeners, I'm going to give that piece of advice. One day you're going to regret every property you ever sell. Nobody's going to listen to me now, but everybody's going to look back one day and realize that I was right. Gosh, you know, and we'll get to that point later in the call, but I, I tell you what, that is such a huge piece of advice because I mean, I even regret a lot of the properties I've sold, you know, yep. in the last two and a half years, over 150 properties we've moved and I should have kept at least a third of them because if I would have done that, you know, it just would have been good. So thanks for sharing that. But Absolutely. Um, you talked about being in C types of properties, C minus types of properties. Why do you choose those? And uh, let's talk about that for a second. Sure. Um, well, it started out that they chose us. Um, I told, I mentioned that first deal, um, that first deal, it, it, we were a little concerned. Um, I, I think what, and th this goes to another big, uh, thing that we've learned over the last couple of years is everybody kind of thinks of real estate in, within the context of what they've experienced. And so I've never lived in a low income apartment complex. Um, and for me, the idea of a low income apartment complex is scary. Um, not scary in, 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 in going to get hurt scared, but managing one is scary because you're dealing with tenants who literally don't have a checking account. They don't have a credit card. Um, I remember when we bought the first property and our property manager were, were like, yeah, it looks like you're collecting money throughout the month. We need to start enforcing like late fees for anybody that doesn't pay by the fifth. And he just laughed. Yeah. He's like, you can enforce them, but people are just going to move out. Um, the way it works is they're getting paid weekly or biweekly. And when they get paid, they, they take part of their paycheck and they hand it over to me. And by the end of the month, most of them have paid their rent. But if you expect them to be able to budget and pay by the fifth, you're not going to have any tenants. Right. Um, and he said, I said, another thing was, we're just like, we can't keep dealing with this cash. Like I trust you. Um, but it's not, it doesn't make me comfortable for you collecting cash and taking it to the bank. Right. And he's like, that's another thing. I mean, you can ask for a check. You can ask for a cashier's check. A lot of the people that live here, if they're busted, if they're bank, if there's not a bank on the bus line or whatever, they can't get a cashier's check. Um, they're, they don't have checking accounts. So it's like you learn to adapt. And so for us, this, this, these C, C minus type properties, they found us and it was a learning experience, but it's turned out to be a great opportunity for a couple of reasons. One, um, because they scare a lot of people who, who want to buy an apartment complex, um, there's not as much competition. Yep. So we've been able to buy several of these simply because there's less competition than there is for the A and the B type properties. Two, um, I'm fairly confident that we're getting towards the top of the market here and it might be a week away, a month away, a year away, it might be two years away, but at some point soon the market's going to turn. And um, historically when the market turns, people that are living in A units will move down to B units and people living in B units are going to move down to C units. People in C units are going to double up or move back home. Um, and so as the market changes, I have a feeling there's going to be more opportunity um, for the, the low income housing, the C-class units, um, for the owners of those units to really see their cap rates bump up a little bit. Um, even if their income doesn't necessarily jump up, um, cap rates are going are, are to jump up. So the values of these properties are going to jump up. So I just think that's a, a good asset class um, for the coming downturn in the market. Uh, yeah, I agree with that 100%. And you know, I think that that actually makes up the majority of the, the, the workforce out there. The people that are living are in mm -hmm. you know, lower to middle income. I mean, that's just the nature of what it is. So you have yep. more tenant base to deal with at that point. You're not dealing with a super high-end, shiny object person that can only, you know, that affords the, 
very high rent and a beautiful condo or, or I'm sorry, apartment. You're dealing with the everyday person that works their blue collar job or just works a job, right? Absolutely. And the nice thing is if they, for the good tenants who like pay every month and um, once they settle in, they're not moving. I mean, it's expensive to, to, to pack up your stuff and move and find another place. And so once they've found a place and they've settled in, if we're happy and they're happy, I mean, we have a lot of tenants who have literally been there. I mean, we have some tenants that don't last more than two or three months because they come up with a security deposit, then they don't pay a single month's rent. Right. Um, but we also have a lot of tenants that have been there for five, 10, 15 years. Um, and they'll live in, in these units until they die. Yep. Yep. And that, you know, brings up a good point. I mean, I have a, a unit so it's just a triplex over in phoenix and it's in a c area type area and when we started out um you know the tenants were always paying late always paying late and i told him andrew i said you gotta start enforcing late fees he's like same thing you know you can do that but there doesn't mean they're gonna pay on time right they're actually gonna move out you're gonna have then you're gonna have uh you know vacancy and that's not what we want so yep. just they'll pay as long as they pay every month let's just keep it moving forward so yep. that good piece of advice for sure yeah I, I know a lot of landlords who basically do things on principle or or they have a rule if you i i, I can't give you a break because if i give you a break i've got to give everybody else a break and i can respect that i mean it's good to have rules um but you also don't want to enforce rules that are going to spite you that are going to spite yourself and and cause you to lose income and if you have a tenant that pays on the 15th of the month i i have a loan out there now i, I do some private lending and i have a borrower who I don't know what her cash flow looks like, but every month she pays me on the 15th instead of the 5th. And it's one of those things I could say, hey, I could argue with her and say, you have to pay on the 5th or you're paying late fees, but why rock the boat? I mean, she's been paying me for three years religiously on the 15th. Um, I'm thrilled. Yeah. So I, I'm not gonna spite myself just to, to enforce arbitrary rules. Right, right, and that's huge. And at the same time, I mean, these are people, these are humans and this exactly. is live, right? Yep. So you got to respect that it's not just a business transaction it's somebody's yep. life it's where they're living so exactly if they're not trying to take advantage of me i'm not going to take advantage of them right now what market specifically are you in other than georgia or where else would you look and you know do you feel comfortable with that just because you live there yep so we like to be in places where either um we are physically present or we have somebody, whether it be a partner, a family member, a project manager, and some other employee, um, a really good real estate agent, perhaps, somebody that is physically located and we know we can trust them. Basically, we can trust them with a checkbook and signing authority. So um, if, if basically the two markets that we're big in right now, um, Baltimore, Washington area, because we live here, and Atlanta and surrounding areas because we have a partner down there that, that we trust implicitly. Um, we have an employee, an old employee of ours that just moved down to Florida. Um, so we'll probably get into that market because we have somebody down there that we trust now. Um, and we've tried a couple other markets over the years um, that we moved in and out of as the markets have changed. Um, but the, the places that have stayed most consistent have been Baltimore, Washington, and Atlanta. Right, right. And I'm from Iowa, um, mm -hmm. and I, I, I love Iowa. There's a lot going on in Iowa, and I'm actually yep. underwriting some deals in Iowa right now in some larger apartments. Um, and I feel comfortable with that because I did live there. I have family that lives there. Yep. I grew up there. I know a lot about the area, and I feel good about that type of, uh, of an investment. But for a lot of investors, and I'm sure a lot of listeners on the call, they don't feel comfortable going outside their market. Or maybe they're going to go try going outside their market, but they don't really know what they're doing. And so they could, you know, burn – burn an opportunity by doing that. So yep. I don't know. I just wanted to touch on that for a second. Absolutely. I mean, it's one of those things that if you've lived someplace, you've got, uh, I'll use the word, a feel for right. that market. Um, somebody gives you the name of a, of a small little town and you know how that town fits into the overall geographic. Um, I mean, if I talk about Baltimore, Baltimore is a big place and there are parts of Baltimore that I would happily live and send my kids to school. There are parts of Baltimore where I wouldn't let my wife walk in the middle of the day. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when you hear something like Baltimore, if you don't know the area um, and literally for a big city, it can be street by street. I mean, one street can be a, a certain 
uh, a certain rent roll, uh, like a certain market rent and, and a certain type of tenant. Um, and one street over could be horrible schools and terrible tenants and much lower rent. Um, and so if you don't know the area inside and out, if you don't have a feel for the area, it's, it's, you can make a mistake really easily. Right. So yeah. that's, that's that. basically just what you said. So, you know, with all that being said, I appreciate all the information you're sharing here, but what's next for you? What does the next five years look like? Where do you see the markets really turning and how are you protecting yourself from that? Yeah. So um, we are slowing down in real estate because I feel like we're getting towards the top. Um, we're certainly not stopping. Uh, never a bad time to invest in real estate, but we're just being a lot more cautious. Yeah. Um, so um, we're doing things like any properties that we have options on, we're either exercising those options or, or cutting them loose. Um, we are basically not buying anything that we're not comfortable holding for at least five or six or seven years. Mm -hmm. um, anything that, um, that we have a loan on that's coming due in the next couple of years, we're refinancing or we're paying off um, yeah. so that we're not going to be holding in, in a higher interest rate and lower value environment potentially. Um, we're not buying any flips that we can't absorb a 20% downturn in the market. And again, these things may not happen. I mean, the market may chug along or we may see a small downturn, but I like to be conservative. And so I like to assume worst case, we're going to see a 25% drop in real estate values and interest rates are going to go up a point and a half or two points and market rents are going to drop 10 or 15%. These are kind of worst case scenarios. Even looking back at 2008, things were much worse than that in most markets. Um, so I'd like to kind of go in thinking, can this deal absorb that worst case scenario? And if it can, I'm going to do the deal. Um, the problem is these days, a lot fewer deals can absorb that type of, of, of change in the market. So we're doing fewer deals. Um, but we're looking forward to uh, if there is a downturn or when there is a downturn, we're looking forward to uh, the deals that are certain to come along and, and hopefully take advantage of it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm excited for that time. You know, in the last five years, my whole real estate career has been on the up, on the up and up. Yep. Things continue to go on the up and up. And I didn't yep. really feel the effects of the downturn that happened last time. I mean, I did to a small extent, but you know, I graduated college at that time. I, yep. I moved into Phoenix at that time. So for me, life was not that bad. But for a yep. lot of people in the world, it's the quite opposite. They Their life got ruined. So I try to stay uh, conservative as well. And that was really why we ended up exiting out of this 18-unit deal that I was just talking about, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of telling people, ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen? And what's your plan if that happens? Right. Um, and if you're comfortable with that plan, if you know how to mitigate that worst case scenario, if you're okay with the worst case scenario, obviously, you're not gonna be happy with it. Um, but if you're okay with it, if you can live with it, go do the deal. But if that worst case scenario keeps you up at night, you should you should rethink because for a lot of us, um, getting good sleep is more important than getting a good deal. Absolutely. Man, I'll tell you what. Well, Jay, you know, it's been really good kind of hearing your story going from <coughs> corporate America, especially Silicon Valley, into jumping into real estate and the success you've had flipping houses, getting into apartments and syndication, um, you know, and kind of what your direction is that you're going with that now. Ton of information. I'm sure, sure the listeners really appreciate uh, you sharing that. But with that being said, are you ready for a lightning round? I am ready for the lightning round. All right, let's do it. What is your hashtag invest this tip uh, to keep our listeners moving forward? Yeah, so my biggest tip to keep moving forward is to set goals. Um, I've noticed throughout my career and my life, um, when I have goals, I'm constantly making forward progress. Um, things are coming together. It's when I don't have goals and I'm just kind of coasting along thinking, okay, I'm going to figure it out as it comes. Um, I find that I'll, I'll get through a year or two years and I'll be right where I started. Um, so for me, setting goals is the, the best way to keep moving forward and, and keep making progress and, and keep, keep piling on those successes. Right. No, that's huge. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, obviously, you're an author, um, but do you have a favorite book that's had a major impact on your life or business or both? Yeah, so um, I, I, I like to say that um, I've probably read less than half of more books than anybody on the planet. Um, <laughs> there is no book that I, I know I can't get 
good information out of. So I, there, there's, there's pretty much no book on the planet I won't pick up and either skim or read a few chapters or, or find the good nuggets in there. Um, so I've read a lot of books. Um, I can name all the ones that I'm guessing a lot of your guests have already named. So I'm going to pick one that uh, I think is a little bit less common that, uh, that has been really instrumental for me as I've grown my business. Uh, it's a book called The Goal. The Goal. Uh, the Goal, um, G-O-A-L. Um, and it was written back in the 70s. And it's basically a book about um, uh, how to scale operations in a business and avoid bottlenecks. So in every business, there are things that there's that that bottleneck, the, the thing that's at the bottom, that's it's, it's the um, um, when it's the slowest guy is going to slow everybody else down. It's whatever is slowing down your business. How to identify what that one big bottleneck is or two big bottlenecks in your business is, um, and then overcome that bottleneck and basically optimize and improve your business by overcoming those bottlenecks. Uh, I didn't do a good job of explaining that, but I highly recommend anybody that's looking to scale and grow their business, check out this book. Appreciate that. I've never heard of it. I'm going to order it. Um, that sounds good. Thanks for sharing. Who's giving you the best advice? Um, other than the tip you gave earlier in the call, who's giving you the best advice and what has that impact been for you? Best advice. Um, so uh, my, um, one of my mentors over the years was uh, a boss at one of my corporate jobs and we've stayed in touch for 10 years. And um, he, uh, he always likes to say, if you're not doing something that makes you uncomfortable every day, you're not growing. Right. Um, basically, the, the, it's, it's part of making goals. You're going to stagnate if you're not doing something that takes you out of your comfort zone. So what I like to do is every day, even if it's something as simple as I, I don't, I'm, I'm really introverted um, and walking up to some, a stranger and starting a conversation for me is terrifying. Um, but even if it's something as simple as starting a conversation with somebody that takes me out of my comfort zone, um, when I do that, I find that like the rest of the day, I feel a little bit more confident. I feel like oh, I can do anything. And all I did was talk to somebody. Um, but then when you do the really big things that take you out of your comfort zone, I mean, it really, it impacts your, your psyche. It impacts your, your outlook and your mental attitude. So my biggest piece of advice is to everybody, just every day, do something that takes you out of your comfort zone. And that's huge. Yeah. Just flexing that muscle of getting uncomfortable, yep. uncomfortable, you know, being uncomfortable is the path to growth. We all know that. Yep. So I appreciate you sharing that. How do you like to give back? Obviously we've had so much success as real estate investors. I'm sure you'd like to give back. Yep. How do you do that? Uh, so, and this is something my wife and I have thought about a lot, especially since we've had kids and uh, we've been very fortunate and um, our kids to some degree have been somewhat privileged. And so it's important to, to kind of send that message that, that you need to give back. For me, it's very much um, little things every day. And this is kind of what I, I implore my kids that, um, you don't need to start a billion dollar foundation. You don't need to be Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, just doing little things like um, walking down the street, you see somebody that looks like they need a helping hand. Um, my kids know we, we'll walk into uh, Dunkin' Donuts and grab coffee and we always pay for the person in front of us and behind us. Um, it's just one of those little things that, that you do good things for people. It makes you feel good. Um, when I drive through a toll booth, I'll pay for 10 people behind me. Um, just brighten up somebody's day. Uh, my kids, um, they, they've really taken these little things to heart, like uh, on their birthdays. Um, the, the best thing I ever saw was last year on my, my son's seventh birthday. Um, we said, what do you want for your birthday? And he said, I don't think I need anything. Can we just have people donate to, and there's a place called Grassroots, which is a, um, a shelter near us. And he's like, can I just ask people to like give money to them and give food to them? And like that said, we're doing the right thing here because our kids are giving up birthday presents to ask people to donate. Especially um, seven years old, of course. As, yeah, exactly. Um, so for us, it really is, it's doing little things every day and, and nothing wrong with doing those big grand gestures, setting up foundations and stuff like that. That's awesome. Um, but for me, I just prefer every day to do little things. It makes me feel good. It makes other people feel good. It, 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 if you can brighten a couple people's day every day, it makes the world a better place. And that's huge. That is massive. Um, Jay, how can they reach you? You know, I'm sure the listeners want to know more about you or just how to get involved. I know that you have your website. Yep. Um, but how, how else can they reach out to you? 
So um, uh, my website, 123flip.com, um, I started that back in 2008. I don't keep up with it as much today, but I have archived the gory details of my first 50 flips on that, uh, on that website. You can see pictures, videos, all the mistakes we've made. You can see our financials down to the penny, uh, basically learn from our first 50, 50 flips. Um, on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash jscottinvestor is my Facebook page. And if anybody wants to shoot me an email, uh, the letter J at 123flip.com. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, we'll definitely add all that in the show notes. And Jay, I really appreciate you being here, man. Like it's awesome. invaluable, the information that we can give to the listeners. I know everybody appreciates it. And I look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, Scott. I really appreciate it. This was awesome. Yeah, talk to you soon. Thanks. Talk soon. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share this podcast to help us spread the word. Go ahead and reach out to Scott Bauer on all the social media outlets for suggestions on topics and guests for the show. And check out investthispodcast.com for more secrets and resources to achieve real success in real estate.